Hi there and welcome to Access Chat. Today we're delighted to welcome John Kemp, who is the CEO of the Viscardi Centre. John, really pleased to have you here. You've got a long and glorious history of working for the rights of people with disabilities. Um, Deborah's told me an awful lot about you, speaks very highly of you. Really pleased that you could join us today. So can you give us a potted history of, of your, your work in, in this area and how you came to um, start advocating for accessibility and, and for the rights of people with disabilities? Well, thank you very much for having me, and it's always a delight to work closely with our my friend Deborah Rue and all, and all of you and uh, talk about this issue. I always have a hard time speaking about myself, but I'll, I'll talk about it very briefly and just say I was born without arms or legs, off at the elbows and the knees. Um, I, I'm the middle child of three. Uh, my mother died uh, when I was very young of ovarian cancer. My dad raised us and, and really did a great job of preparing each of each of us to be able to go out into this world and be ready. So he really pushed me into a mainstream school, uh, and I had to keep up. And in, in keeping up, it, would, it got harder and harder as the kids got more physically capable and could do more things. But at least intellectually, I was I was keeping up all right. And went through grade school, middle school, high school, um, and then on to Georgetown University in Washington D.C. and was very actively involved and. Felt very comfortable with my disability, and, and given my disability, I can still climb. I can still climb steps, but always found that ramps were a whole lot easier. And started to see the pluralism and the way accessibility is defined. So uh, as I got as I got older and went through law school and became part of the disability rights community, um, I, I began to really focus on it as a profession, not just living with it personally, but that I got, had a message to deliver and that I thought I could I could help a lot of people. I was very fortunate in my life to have a, gotten a good education thanks to my dad. So given that, I really embarked on a, on a career of creating my own consulting firm when I was 27 years of age uh, and consulting with businesses because I always thought the business side of it needed, the, needed, needed more support and they really needed to understand what uh, an advocate would say to them, and then they could decide whether they wanted to adopt what I was recommending and other advocates were recommending or not. But I'm a, a moderate person, and I understand their pressures as well, but I try to maneuver and figure out a way and navigate a way for them to be able to achieve compliance and above. So I spent my time doing consulting work, and then, then becoming part of the National Easter Seal Society, moving to Washington, D.C. as a national executive director of the United Cerebral Palsy, which is a today a billion dollar disability organization with numerous affiliates around the country and um, then joined uh, the very special arts organization which is a global disability organization where I learned a lot about arts culture and disability and the transmission of our culture of disability through the arts is a very powerful mechanism and then uh, joined a law firm after that to kind of get back to my roots of being a lawyer and combining it all and did that for about 11 years and I'm just very happy to uh, have been asked to come and run the, the Viscardi Center on Long Island. So giving up my time in Washington, D.C., 25 years there, and moving to Long Island, all big changes. And um, here I find a gem of a place. So if you want me to describe a little bit about it, I will. Absolutely, yes. Okay. Great. The Viscardi Center is uh, an organization that is local to international in its reach and scope and in its mission. We have 355 employees, a $25 million budget, about $25 million in the bank in case of a rainy day, it might happen. But we, put, we have a school for medically fragile children who would otherwise be in a hospital setting or at home. We have a service provider organization that uh, addresses the transition services needs of adolescents with disabilities from age 14 to all the way up to age 25. And then we also have the National Business and Disability Council, which works employer to employer, much like the USBLN, which I also ran out of the law firm in Washington, D.C. So I'm very used to the business to business approach to um, change and uh, progress. So that's what that's what's going on here. And uh, see, I've been to Cairo, Egypt, in the last 30 days, and 30 days from now, I'll be going to Singapore, thanks to 
my friend Deb Baru introducing me to people there. Uh, and it's, it, this is a topic, the whole issue of accessibility and accessible ICT is something that Deborah and I and many others are like you are very committed to solving and, and we never want to slow down the innovation that goes on either here at the Viscardi Center or in companies or by uh, the very good work that a lot of companies are doing on their own but the consultants and like. So we're trying not to slow down any innovation but to make sure that people with disabilities participate in all of that innovation in real time. Okay, fantastic. So I know Antonio's got a question, so I'll, I'll, I'll let him chime in. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, John. No, uh, going back to the beginning of your uh, introduction, you know, uh, I would like to know, when you were, were a kid and when you were facing all the challenges uh, uh, into the education world, and if you compare where we are today, can you just give us you know, an, an idea about where we went and where we are today? and your perspective in, in relation to, to the future uh, in, in that area as well. Well, Antonio, that's a, a great question, and I appreciate Neil's questions as well. I, I, I would have to summarize by saying that we, we still aren't where we should be, that advocacy is taking a much longer time. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the absolute inclusion of people with disabilities still lags. Mm -hmm. The built environment is still a challenge to many of us. I, I wear prostheses, but I also use scooters, three-wheel scooters to get around uh, in long walking situations. And I, I, I know we're not there yet, um, either in the United States or around the world. But in the United States, we made a conscious decision when we passed the Rehabilitation Act in 1973, and it, as part of it um, had the Architectural Barriers Act embedded in it in Section 502, that really said that as of a certain point in time, we will not allow any buildings to be built uh, inaccessibly. And we drew a, a, t a line in time and said, going forward, all buildings will have to be accessible to people with disabilities that those buildings that are publicly funded in any way or are available to the public in any way really have to be built accessibly. And building codes from the federal to the state to the local communities all fell into, into play. And for the most part, they followed pretty good rules. But we had to draw a, a line in the time and saying, going forward, we're not going to build any more inaccessible buildings, only accessible buildings buildings. challenge a little bit um, today in the accessible or virtual environment where the virtual environment changes so rapidly when video is now the new email and of technologies uh, that are really awesome. I mean we love them and yet at the same time we want to make sure that people with disabilities have the right to be able to participate them in real time just as the buildings today, the newer buildings today are now built accessible to who have physical disabilities or blindness or deafness, we really have to do the same and have the same kind of commitment to doing that. And so having, you know, is, is, is access to the web and, the, and, you know, the internet a civil right in the United States? Is it a civil right like it is in the built environment? And finally, I do think that the U.S. Department of Justice has embraced the idea that access to the internet is a right, is a right. It took the target case in 2007 and a lot of, a lot of federal laws that, and, the, and the federal, federal cases being brought that really brought about this process. But I think we're about there to where the White House is about to, to put this out there that this is the law of the land. It has been difficult. There's a great deal of resistance and even from the internet companies, they don't want to have any federal legislation that might limit the, the creativity and innovation that is really inherent in the, in the web itself and in the, in the global communication system. So we're fighting a big battle, but we, we really don't want to slow down progress, and that's kind of where we are today. Okay. So uh, I know Deborah's got a question, but I just want to interject um, first. Um, I, I think that the, the seminal moment that for, for me where the tide turned was the, the judgment around captioning because then then the, the, the court decided that actually the internet was a public place and therefore you had to make kind of accommodations and, and, and I, I think that that was, that was a turning point and, and that 
that from from that point on, it's it's going to be harder and harder and harder for for companies that that exist on the internet to deny products and services to people with disabilities. That's not to say that I don't see problems uh, ahead, because I think that yes, we want to innovate, and yes, when you bring new technologies to bear. The people that are inventing the new technologies might not be well versed with accessibility, but that's an education, and that's something that we need to work on. But large-scale products and services, I think now there's a general acceptance that that going forward they're going to have to be made accessible. So, um, so I think it, it is. It's definitely a sea change. I think you're you're hitting it right on the head. I think that 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 was a tipping point. When, the, when not only government but industry felt that there were adequate numbers and adequate opportunities that should be assured to people with disabilities. You know, there, there is a, a sort of a, a, a rump group of people with disabilities that say, do we really have to make a business case that this is good for business to serve people with disabilities and that enough blind people, deaf people, other people will use the web so that we have to build in structure through the web, web developers, this, the accessibility features? And the answer is, you know, it, it's kind of, it kind of makes me resentful that we have to do it. But at the same time, there are a lot of people that don't understand the, the depth and scope of issues of disability and accessibility and how they are pluralistic in the way they reach people and, and afford choices in a, to a lot of people who aren't, dis, aren't people with disabilities. If somebody wants to flip on the the um, voice recognition software and just read along what somebody is saying, and maybe they have difficulty in understanding English, it's a perfect example of the pluralism, the the platform, and the broadening out of the use of of such technologies that really afford all people equal as much equal access as possible. But underlying it, to me, the the baseline is that there is a fundamental civil right. But above that, I kind of like to think. We are hot property. We're newfound market. Come on and get us. We want to give you our money. We want to buy products and services if we believe that you're accessible, and that means physically accessible, but also technologically accessible. So, come get our money, but show us show us that you really want us. Thanks, Deborah. Over to you. Yeah. Well said, John. Well said. Uh, of course, so we've talked about the consumers, we've talked about education, and I think um, we can talk quite a bit about employment as well. And I know, John, one thing that you are doing um, successfully and I think is a best practice that, um, that I'm seeing in the United States and also I think a, a lot of the other countries can learn a lot from it is the transition and, and in, into meaningful, marketable you know, uh, employment. And uh, I, I also, a, as you think about the question, um, uh, one thing that you and I have worked for many, many years on, and a lot of other people, we had mentioned Susan Scott Parker and others, um, is making sure the employers are in the conversation and they're in a conversation in a way that really um, helps them feel that they're a valued stakeholder in these conversations. But uh, when I visited the Viscardi Center, which I recommend any of our viewers to uh, check out the Viscardi Center, it's pretty amazing. I, I was so impressed with um, some of the um, locations. I know at the time you had um, a retail store and you had a USP store and or uh, um, um, UPS, excuse me, store where the students could actually and these are real franchises. So will you talk a little bit about how the work you've done has led to where you are and how that is actually helping us embrace transition and then real employment? Absolutely. Um, I, my, my whole life has been really focused on employment and I think technology is, a, is an enabler of employment. Uh, it can be in and of itself employment, but I think it, it, we use so much technology just as we are right now uh, in carrying out our work and so um, having people be able to access and use and be comfortable with various kinds of technology and social media is critical to their success in the workplace. But where we take people where we find them, and a lot of people have not been privileged to have f learned and become familiar with technology as a, as a necessary tool in the workplace. So we spend a lot of time uh, and effort training people to for, for real jobs in the community. 
we have a business advisory board that meets with us about the curriculum that we develop, the tools that we use, the cash registers in the UPS store and the gap funded store that we have here on our campus. And they and company representatives come and keep it keep it fresh, keep it current. So everything that they're working on is, is something that's used in the stores today. Uh, transition is terribly important because there are a lot of young people whose expectations of work have never really been created, either because their you know, disability is so new to families, they, this, their child might be the first person in their family that has a disability of a certain kind. And so, you know, we all have to sort of create expectations, high expectations for our, our kids with disabilities. Just like you've done, Deborah, with your daughter, who is just a, a remarkable, you know, just remarkable, Sarah, it's just incredible. All right, so you, you created high expectations and opportunities for her, and my dad did the same thing for me. He, he really said, you know, when you get out of college and when you go to work, it wasn't if, it was when. And you'll, you know, he painted this picture of independence and how I was going to live independently. I wasn't going to live at home, uh, unlike some of the millennials and others who are still living at home. But the point is that we have, through transition, give these kids the, the tools they need, the experiences that they need to be able to go out into the community and raise the bar on our expectations for them and not let them think that once they get through school of any kind, they're going back home and sitting on the couch. That is not appropriate. It is not good for them or their families to do that. So that's part of our training program that we do with young people in their transition. We take them out, show them different workplaces, show them what it might be to en enlist in the military, um, how, to, how to work at animal shelters, anything that might fit what they want to do. And then they have to kind of decide what it is they love to do. So technology itself can be such an enabler. And just for example, 65% uh, of our students who graduate from our school I've already said they're going into digital media arts in some way. They know they're they're so severely disabled. They know they're not moving furniture. Like I'm not going to move furniture. Nobody nobody's ever asked me in my life to move furniture. Thank God. <laughs> but they're going to work. They're going to work in digital media. And so the more we give them the tools, we have a full studio here. We're heavily heavily heavy users of technology of all kinds. We're teaching them everything we possibly can so that they can embrace the technologies and create the next technologies that come along. So these are our future inventors and innovators and not only are they using it and going to use it in work, they are going to innovate for themselves and for their communities. John, I know that with the, the NBDC you work with a lot of uh, major, corpor uh, major corporations and that they're very engaged in these conversations and I, uh, I wanted to give you the opportunity to give some of those major corporations some kudos for the efforts that are being made. So do you want just to talk about some of, some of the um, employers and corporations that you're working with at NBDC? Well, it's very nice of you to, to take me there because I, I am very proud of NBDC and I think the, the, the employer community generally and and my, my perspective working in this field for quite a number of years and with USBLN before the NBDC is that companies really want to do the right thing. I think it's wrong to assume that we have companies who have said we don't want people with disabilities to participate. We don't want any of the, those people around us. That is not at all the way they think. They think about productivity. They think about um, sociability. They think about harmony in the workplace, how, the, how well they get along, and, and, and that workplaces need to rethink how they employ people because people come in different sizes and shapes with different capabilities. And once we broaden human ability, now we're starting to talk about how we wrap our arms literally around the entire population. Uh, we get such good thinkers out of EY and, and Lori Golden, for example, and Francis West with IBM, and just you know extraordinary people who are really teaching their own fellow employers why there is a need, not only from an employment standpoint and not at the entry level, but that there's a whole lot of talent out there coming out of colleges and universities, people with disabilities, who really can help them produce to their bottom line net effect. There are customers with disabilities who look at companies and say, 
I wonder if they're employing people with disabilities there. If I don't think they are, I may not give them my business as a customer with a disability. Banks have been very early on in this, and I think you know you get banks like SunTrust and maybe Morgan Chase and a number of groups like that that really do think very broadly. Wells Fargo, extraordinary company. Um, Kathy Martinez is there now, even leading to greater, greater things. So banks are early adopters because they have such interaction with so many people on the front lines, and they know the value of a customer with a disability. And by the way, as people age into disability, um, a substantial amount, in my, estim my estimation, uh, which I've done some mathematical formulas to create, is that about 40% of the net worth of people in the United States is controlled by people with disabilities. Now you think about, are we a valuable group to be talking to and, and designing and, and programming for? Yes, if we control 40% of the net worth in the United States, then we better be paying attention to this marketplace. So uh, we've got great groups and great companies as our members at NBDC, and you can go to NBDC uh, through our website at viscardicenter.org and look at our National Business and Disability Council, we have a whole strand that we focus on on accessible ICT. Okay, that's, that's fantastic. So uh, a lot of the arguments you're making are arguments that I, they're very familiar to me because they're the arguments that I also make when I'm going out and preaching to um, both internal and external customers. Uh, my job's both public and, and internal facing. And, and it's also gratifying for you to sort of pretty much name check a whole bunch of our guests because we've had Laurie on and we've had, <laughs> uh, we've had the banks on and we've had Francis. Francis. So it's, it's, it's <laughs> She's just got Parker. Yeah. They're the leaders. <laughs> they're, they're the leaders. They're the best. That's great. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and now we're <laughs> so um, I think it's really important that we we understand the value. And I think that the, the demographic mega trends that are happening throughout the globe are very, very significant. And it's when you start talking to the organizations, and, and organizations like mine that supply government, when you say, these are things that are concerning governments right now, and these are the people that are awarding the billion dollar, multi-billion dollar contracts, you really ought to be thinking about this stuff. And then you see the light bulb go on. We also, um, I think you, you mentioned about sort of the whole working environment. I think this is really important too. Uh, as someone that's working within my organization to make it a much better place for disabled employees, um, we also believe that diversity is something that, and, and we, we're looking at the wider diversity case, not just disability, but disability is one of the four key dimensions of our diversity policy. Uh, right. is, that it drives performance. So, so we talk about from diversity to performance so to enable us to, to really key into people's minds that actually homogeneity isn't what's going to drive performance. That's going to drive groupthink. And actually, the innovation that, that companies really value so highly comes from having wide range of people with loads of different perspectives and abilities. So. Um, so I think that's that's a really important point to make is that innovation comes from employing people that are different and that that businesses can really derive great value from this. Uh, it's, it's just perfectly stated, Neil. I, honestly, that's that's a, a a perfect argument for it, and and I do think that everyone benefits by having a diverse workforce. And if and if you don't think that the world is diverse, you're not looking out your car window or your living room or you're not paying attention to who's shopping in the stores and in the aisles next to you, this world is very diverse today, and that's who, is, who we are, just part of the fabric of the world and America. So, yeah, yeah. right on. Well, absolutely, and in Europe too. So um, if you look at, at, at what's happening with the, all of the migration, what people forget is the underlying reasons why Angela Merkel is throwing open the doors, and that's because by 20, 2050, um, their, oh, sorry, I think it's 2050, their average age of their population is going to be 52 years old. So, and that's, that's, the, that's the median age. Right. So, so they've got to do something. Uh, and of course with age you've got acquired disabilities. So I'm very interested in your 40% of net worth stats. I'd love to see the, uh, the calculations behind that. I may have to steal some of that from you. <laughs> 
an appropriated bit for Europe and the UK. Um, but yeah, that's 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 that's, uh, that's really interesting. I, I can I can well believe it. At first, you think, oh, that's incredulous. Uh, yeah. that, but then you think, well, most of the wealth is locked up in in, in equity and. And, and everything else, and, and you, know, you see all of the stay-at-home kids and the millennials that are living with their parents. That's because the parents don't have the wealth, and, and it's not transferred, exactly. and they're living longer. <laughs> that's so, exactly right. I, they they get into disability, and yeah. they own a lot of property and stocks, and you know all the other things that go with it. You're you're understanding it correctly. Yeah. So um, what? So you you talked about the the Viscardi Center being international in scope. So can can you just give us a bit more about that? Because obviously Antonio and I are coming from a different part of the world. So what do you do internationally, and other than tour with Deborah? Yeah, it's, <laughs> you know, it's always fun to tour with Deborah, and and if I get to catch up with her, she's kind of hard to keep up with, but um, she <laughs> plows some good ground for me, and I I follow I sometimes follow where she has been. Uh, but we are um, we are communicating globally through our technology resources. We do webinars that are reaching out to the world. Um, we're making a particular push uh, in the web accessibility area. I don't think there are too many um, providers that are out there trying to help. We also do a lot of document remediation and things like that. But we're really trying to partner up and, and look at, at the whole use of technology in function and and the whole idea of sensors and you know the anticipatory kinds of things that people uh, when you enter a room and they know it's you the room knows it's you and the lights go to your dimensions and your, your requests and doors open automatically and you know so it can be very granular but we're trying very hard to, to jump onto some international and with some international companies that are looking at the sensors business because we think that an awful lot of Function is going to be physical function is going to be improved by having by looking at these sensors, uh, and so that's just one little aspect of, of what we we're doing. We try to another area that I, I will say is, is not necessarily exactly on point with with technology, but an area that where we're showing some international work is that we've we've created a partnership with a company here on Long Island that happens to be the 250th largest company, a publicly traded company on. Wall Street, and that's the Henry Shine Corporation, and it's a, a supplier of medical goods and services, dental goods and services, and veterinarian goods and services globally. So it's this huge company. And what we found is that, this, that, that people with disabilities, but almost all people, have better health when they have better oral health. And so people with disabilities, especially kids who are like at our school here who have cerebral palsy, and have a lot of difficulty taking care of their teeth and, and lots of problems, have a lot of oral health problems, which translates <coughs> in, as a gateway into the body. And so they have very severe complications, heart problems later in life. They die prematurely. They live a, a not as good a quality of life. So we've partnered up with them to do a, an international conference here uh, next year. And in the following year, we'll partner with, uh, with Shalva in Israel so that we can have a here and there conference in 2017 and 2018 to really talk about uh, oral health and people with disabilities. It sounds, and, and it's really for the whole public, but people don't understand how important oral health really is. Okay, so that's sparked off two questions in my in my head. The the first is, I, I, I get the idea that, that it's a gateway for bacteria and other things to get into the, the body, but I'm wondering how much of the good oral health is also connected with the fact that if you take care of your oral health and you're going to the dentist, you are more likely then to also take care of yourself anyway and, and visit the doctor. And also dentists quite often spot illnesses that don't get picked up by the doctor because they're... So, so I'm wondering whether there are a number of factors at play here. There are a number of factors and one of them is in the US the reimbursement rate for dental visits for kids with disabilities primarily and people, just generally people with disabilities who are of maybe impoverished of some kind is so low and so, and so um, inappropriate that many dentists refuse to see kids with disabilities, especially I'll just say kids with autism and maybe on the uh, auto, have an autism spectrum. 
because many times it might take four or five or six different visits before a person with autism really gets comfortable with the setting, the lighting, the noises, the, the tools that the dentist is going to use. That dentist does not get reimbursed but for one visit. And that might take five or six visits and they finally say, oh, I can't afford to see this person. Well, what happens to the person with autism who does not get appropriate dental care? So it's tied into the funding mechanisms, the insurance reimbursements, and uh, all sorts of schemes that really need to be looked at in a much broader way. Okay. Deborah, did you have another question? Sorry, uh, the only point is that I know there's been some, um, quite a few studies that show poor oral dental health can lead to heart disease. So it's, it's very significant what we're finding. And as you had noted, Neil, um, I know that, you know, when you go to the dentist, they can find all kind of things that can, you know, uh, prevent other really serious diseases. So um, it's very important, very important topic. And I commend you, John, for once again taking care of all of us, making sure, you know, as a parent of a, a child, you know, Sarah's 29, now, but we had some real hard, hard times uh, taking her to the dentist. It, it was I went to one dentist for years. He kept saying, "Oh, she's too young. She's too young." But I'll see your other child who didn't have Down syndrome. And by the time I got her to a dentist, she had seven cavities, and it was it was very traumatic for all of us. So um, that's just one tiny little snapshot of a, of a family. And you know, Sarah's 29 now, so it's it's a it's a global problem. We will, we will stream our conference globally. Excellent. We'll have accessible technology to do it. We will take questions back, and we will create videos uh, that are available to you and to anybody that's listening as a result of, of this. So there is a technology overlay to the communication side of this that says the word has got to get out. Yes. When, when is that happening? Well, the planning conf we have a planning conference in September, and we'll do it in the spring, probably in May of 2017, and then in Israel a year later uh, in 2018. Excellent. Okay. I'll keep you informed, I promise. Yeah. We'll, help you, we'll help you talk about it on social media. That would be great. <laughs> you, you are the masters. <laughs> so, so I'm going to channel my inner Antonio now and, and, and talk about the other thing that you you alluded to, and that is the, the sensors and the Internet of Things, because I think that, uh, like you, I believe that there's an enormous amount of potential in this, um, and contextual-based accessibility is where we need to be going. Uh, it's all very well to have accessibility tools and assistive technology on your desktop computer, but you need it on your mobile, you need it wherever you are going to be if you're to live life to the fullest and to get the level playing field wherever you are, not just seated behind the desk. So uh, what are you doing um, and who are you working with to, 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 to look into this aspect? Well, the mobile part, we, we know that there are a couple of organizations that are looking at the continual look, uh, review of mobile apps. And I hope that they're still running with it and doing it because I th think the accessibility of these new apps is always going to be a challenge and uh, for a lot of people with physical and sen sensory disabilities and intellectual disabilities, it's really going to be a challenge. So, you know, we have our partners. We have kind of back-of-the-house uh, partners. Uh, Infinity Media is one of our uh, behind-the-scenes partners that will assist us. In doing much of this work, Deborah and, and others who we know um, we would certainly want to partner with, but we are right now just exploring and using um, some of the companies like, you know, Canon is is a Japanese company that has its all of its Americas operations are right here on Long Island from North, Central, and South America. Canon has reinvented itself since you know it was a you know just a printer kind of a company. It's really gone into very high-tech kinds of, uh, of activities. And so we're in the early stages of talking with Canon, which is located here, about much broader applications in this area. But the IoT is exactly where I think we should be, we should be and we should be going to as people with disabilities and as organizations serving people with disabilities. We are looking very closely at all aspects of it. The Amazon 
Alexa, the Echo is is just the tip of the iceberg, I think, in, in how we can create accessibility of information and services and the like. Okay. I've got, because like, like, like Neil was saying, you know, today we, we, there's quite a good number of projects in the United States and Europe, all, all over the world in relation to smart cities. And they all bring this conversation of Internet of Things. So uh, b building and making sure that there are accessibility requirements at that level can make the life of people with disabilities a lot easier if that, that goes forward. Right. I, I think part of our, our case that still has to be made is that we are a significant part. We, we can argue the civil rights kind of compliance floor level, but really what we try to talk about is this is good for everybody, and we and and that and then when you talk about a population, and we and we reach out to the margins, literally reach out to the margins of the population, of not just economic margins, but the human human factors, human capabilities margins, intellectual, physical, even emotional. We really have to expand the scope of which we're trying to grab people's attention and also to ask them to serve these populations. But if they can reach to the margins and serve them, they catch everybody in, in between. And that right. means young people with disabilities, people who are not necessarily natural language uh, users of the, of the country they're in, um, seniors who are aging into disability and are com in complete denial that they have disabilities. Um, you know, you have an, an 80, 90 year old person who can hardly walk and they'll say, that handicapped parking spot is not for me. You know, it's like, okay, okay, <laughs> not gonna, not gonna argue with you. But if, but if, if part of it is a cultural issue, I'll just say, I, I, and Deborah knows I talk a lot about culture, but it's how do we think of ourselves as people with disabilities? Do we culturally think of ourselves as worthy of, of being served in an equal way? And I think people still perceive people with disabilities as sort of a step down group that isn't quite up there and doesn't really they kind of like stick out on the side and they're hard to deal with and you know it, it's kind of a pain and and we say no 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 it's your mom your dad your brother your sister your child it's everybody and you can stop making that kind of an argument you got it you got to reach to the, the widest sense possible yeah well I said the, I think the you hit on a, a perfect point for us to close um, Thank you so much. It's been a, a great conversation. Uh, like it to have had you here today. So thank you very much, John, and we'll, we'll, we'll say goodbye. Neil, thank you very much, and Antonio, and to my dear friend Deborah, thank you very, very much for this opportunity. Really enjoyed thank it. Thank you. Thank, thank you, John. You were amazing.